Hey, good morning, Pro. And everyone, Pro, are you ready to start now? Yes. Okay, thank you, Pro. All right. A very good morning to Dato, Datin, professors, associate professors, doctors, lecturers, researchers, and fellow students. First of all, thanks to Renew for organizing this webinar. And of course, thank you, Professor Najima, for accepting our invitation as a speaker today. Thank you, Pro. Also, thanks to our participants for spending time with us this morning, despite your tight schedule. For your information, our webinar today is live streamed on YouTube as well. So for your friends who cannot join our session today, they may watch the recorded video later. To ensure the smooth running of this webinar, I would like to seek kind cooperation from the participants on WebEx to remain muted during the presentation. We will be having a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. You can drop your questions in the chat box and I will read out the question on your behalf or for our participants in WebEx, you may unmute yourself to ask the question directly to our speaker. All right, to start with, allow me to introduce myself. I am Xiao Eng Ping, lecturer from the Department of Food Science and Technology, Faculty of Applied Sciences, UITM Shala. You can call me EK, and I am the moderator for today's session. For your information, Professor Najima has a very long and impressive CV, but I will just make a very brief introduction for her today. Professor Najima is a professor of food science at School of Science, Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand. She obtained her degree in Bachelor of Food Science from the University of Nottingham, UK, India, 1991, and her Master in Food Biotechnology and PhD in Food Science from the University of Strathclyde, UK, India, 1992 and 1997, respectively. Upon completion of her studies, Professor Najima served as the Principal Research Scientist at Standards and Industrial Research Institute Malaysia, Sirin. Driven by her immense interest in teaching, she then joined University Putra Malaysia, India, 1996 as a lecturer. Next, in this 2007, yeah, 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 yeah
Please welcome Professor Najima. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. E.K. Thank you so much for the lovely um, introduction. And uh, thank you to uh, UITM for having me uh, for my sabbatical. So today I will just start off um, on uh, the talk, writing the first draft of a research paper. So we know this is what we all aspire to do as academicians uh, because uh, we, we supervise uh, research students and uh, you know through that means uh, we, we get those publications or well, we can carry out research ourselves but we're just so uh, you know busy with uh, teaching commitments uh, administrative uh, commitments and so uh, our students our research students play a big role um, in in our research at the universities so first of all i would just like to talk about um, the components of uh, a research paper and we all know that uh, we, we, we we've all uh, published and uh, these are just uh, Im important components of a research paper. And it's also known as IMRAD, IMRAD, uh, where I uh, is uh, introduction. You're, you're asking the question, uh, what, what is um, the research about? You're, you're supposed to justify why you're carrying out the research in this section. Then, of course, you have your methods section uh, to say how the research was carried out and uh, the results, that's the R. Uh, the A is just end, so um, there's no A really. Uh, so uh, you go, uh, the next uh, important part of a research paper is discussion. So I will be going through this uh, in, in that sequence initially, but when it comes to preparing a first draft, it's not necessary that you will be following I M R D. Okay, so I'm just going to explain to you the components of a research paper first and then guide you on how you can go about getting a draft. And that's a big step uh, for uh, most of us getting that first draft. Why? What? How? So why did you start the experiment or the research in the first place? So that's what we should be covering. Ninja, when writing an introduction, is putting uh, things that are not relevant. Trust me, because uh, when I get uh, feedback from the reviewers after submitting my article, most people say you, you, you have problems with discussion, but really with me, I've had countless of times where um, I've been asked to rewrite the introduction. So it's, it's quite unusual, but not uh, impossible. So an introduction is very important. What did you do? How was it done? This is what we should be covered in the materials and methods section. Uh, what did you find? What was learned? Uh, this is what you have in your results section. And the big thing is the discussion. So in some journals, you have results and discussion together. And in some journals, you have discussion separate from results. It really depends. Uh, for most sensory science articles that I write, it tends to be separate. But if I'm publishing in Food Research International or Food Chemistry, they are most often together. So you have a results and discussion section. So what do you include in discussion? What you're really telling the audience is what the, do the results mean and how do they relate to what is already out there in terms of research carried out? First of all, when we look at a paper, it is the title. And I tell you now, uh, believe, believe it or not, that's the, that's the thing that will sell your paper. So just don't you know, think I've done good research here, but you must 
have a good title. And you must try and not have a very long title. I know you're trying to tell people what you want, what you're carrying out, but uh, try and choose the fewest word possible that adequately describe the content of the manuscript. Try and make it catchy. Uh, I, I work with Charles Spence and he's a professor at University of Oxford and he has uh, um, papers uh, with titles like Tasteful Sounds. Um, and, you know, uh, it just catches you. But I'm not, it's not easy, okay, when, when you're doing science to come up with, uh, with a title like that. But what you want is to capture the reader's attention. And um, because when uh, your journal, uh, your manuscript is going through uh, the editor, uh, that's the first point of contact. And they will look at your title. So it must help identify the main issue of the manuscript, distinguish the subject of the man manuscript, and always, always use every word that you put in your title should be accurate, unambiguous, a specific. Yeah, don't don't uh, go and use words that are um, unnecessary, you know, unnecessary details because it's just going to make it long and not attention catching. Do not add abbreviations. OK, so please stay away. So for example, you're uh, carrying out research using um, high pressure processing. So don't have HPP in the title. It has to be in full. And the second component of a research paper is the abstract. OK, and that abstract is important. It's a statement that places your work in context. All right, so that's the first thing the reviewer or the editor will read. And that's when they will decide whether the paper is suitable for publications or not. So in the abstract, I would say that is the heart of your paper. You have to have a statement um, that uh, shows how your research fits in. Yeah, uh, and then after that, the methods used very briefly, you don't need to go into great details. You have to indicate some main results, yeah, but not too much numbers. But if the results are significant, it's good to add it in there. Uh, and, and somewhat you need to uh, conclude. And uh, there is a recommendation you can throw in if you want to. Some journals will require a shorter abstract. So you, you, you really must see what the author guidelines are before you attempt um, writing an abstract. So what is a good abstract? So like I said, the abstract is the heart of your paper. It's a miniature version of your entire paper with a background, scientific question, results, yeah, um, not too much of the numbers, but, um, you know, what it means, uh, some sort of discussion, you're lucky if you can throw that in there, all within a single paragraph. And after the abstract, the third component of your paper is the introduction. The introduction is very, very important. Not so much once, um, you know, it's not something that the editor will go too much in detail. They, they really would read your abstract. Your abstract needs to be really good. Introduction is where you will get the reviewers gaining most of the information they require in order to understand the paper. All right. And that's why you can get lots of um, comments um, when it comes to the introduction section, because if you do not help your uh, reviewers to understand why you carry out, carried out this research, you're going to be in big trouble because they have difficulty understanding it, although they are experts in your area. 
Okay, so you are good in your area, but you still need some information to help you understand why the study is carried out. So, first of all, in an effective introduction, you need to declare the overall topic for the reader. Okay, that, so that's basically your, your first paragraph of your introduction where uh, you will uh, talk about uh, the research overall, an overall overview of, um, you know, the research, why it is important. And then, uh, secondly, you need to provide the relevant background material to demonstrate the work leading up to your experiments. So, like I said, your introduction is there to help justify your research. And by introducing all the different studies, you are able to define a clear problem or identify a research gap as to why you're carrying out the research in the first place. So you're placing, you're emphasizing why it's important. And um, uh, finally, um, at, in the last paragraph of your introduction, you need to clearly define the purpose of the study. So look, at your objective once you've written it, read it again and see how it addresses uh, the existing problems that you identified in your background reading. All right, so we know A, we know B, we know C, but we don't know what's next. Also, here is how we are going to go about it to find D. So that's basically um, what you should do in your introduction to explain that to the reviewers. Okay, so you need to, uh, in, in terms of objectives, they're, they're very important. All right, you, you need to think through well, what, what is the research question and um, the purpose of the manuscript you need to establish the proper frame of reference for the reader and you need to identify uh, the manuscript's contribution to the field and convince the reader that there is justification in undertaking the research that you carry out. So if you look at the final paragraph of an introduction, it's not just going to be a one or two liner. All right, you need to uh, be able to summarize, yeah, establish why um, you've arrived at that objective. So it's not as simple as you think it, it should be just throwing in the objective there because that, that will help convince why you're carrying out the research in the first place. So establish a research territory, that's very important because um, showing that the general research area is important, it's central, it's interesting, or it could be some problem. Um, it's, it's very, very important to establish why you're, you're carrying out this research in the first place. And that's why you need to introduce and review previous work um, that helps justify the work that you are carrying out. So how do you establish a niche? Okay, you, you, you've indicated you from your readings, okay, readings are the most important thing before you carry out a research. You need to identify the gap and you need to indicate this gap. This gap is what you should be identified in probably the last par paragraph of your introduction before you introduce your objective. Uh, raising a question about it um, or extending previous knowledge in some way. That's just oblig obligatory. Okay, so you need to occupy the niche. Uh, you need to outline the purpose um, and you can see some is obligatory, some is optional. Okay, uh, this is just uh, saying how you can um, self fit fit in a niche um, and and that's what uh, gets you uh, gets your paper uh, going through the review process and that's one 
that's a big thing getting the paper under review because sometimes it it doesn't even go into review and you end up with a rejection so it's really really challenging and that's why it's so so important to 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 identify the niche in in your research So um, this could be an introduction exercise you could do uh, after this talk. Um, look at your papers, look at other papers in journals you aspire to um, publish in, and uh, try and identify the research qu questions, the manuscripts contribution, uh, look at how they describe the underlying framework of the research, uh, look at how the authors describe the gap in that research, because only by reading other papers, then you 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 are able to to write one you know, yourself. So it's not just a matter of you know jumping and writing, but uh, see with care what what others have done. Hypothesis can also be intro. Uh, Actually, uh, sometimes my students include this in, in their introduction. It's not necessary for a lot of chemistry ones, but it's uh, more critical. So it's probably uh, more the social science, the psychology, uh, and, and you know some, some sensory sciences um, that you need to develop hypotheses. Uh, a lot of the ones I see in food chem does not have hypothesis, but when you are developing a hypothesis, just make sure they are not obvious. Uh, they are not truisms. That means things that are uh, true. You know, you, you can't change that. That, that, that is, it's, it's true and, and there's nothing you can do to prove otherwise. Or it's common knowledge because that shows that your research is not going to be unique because if, you, if your hypotheses are, are that obvious. Make sure your hypothesis focuses on a single testable item. I limit the number of hypotheses. Sometimes when you're in the social science, you have got a conceptual framework, for example, and you, within that framework, you can have your hypothesis. So it does not need to sit in the introduction. It can sit within the framework that you are uh, you know, that you have. Link the hypothesis to the theoretical development in your manuscript. And uh, when you're writing hypothesis, uh, avoid your null hypothesis and specify the directional one, the directional effects, all right, of your, uh, and, and of your expected results. Methodology, all right, so this is the method section. And this demonstrates that you have followed acceptable scientific standards in conducting your research. This enables other researchers to read your paper and carry out um, their experiments. And being able to carry out those experiments, they are then able to compare their results to your results. And that's how you get citations. All right, so the method section is really important. You, when it is a new method, you have to describe it in great detail. And if it's an established method, you may get away just citing a reference and um, saying what, what the method is. I'll, I'll cover this in a while. So these are the different components of the method section. Your study design, it's really, really important. Um, sometimes people have some flow charts uh, that help the reader understand what was being carried out. The study setting, where was it carried out? The selection of participants. If you're doing sensory work or you're working with people, you need to um, uh, you know, uh, include what the inclusion and exclusion criteria criteria are uh, in terms of participants that you choose to include in the experiment. Sample size, all right? So sample size is something uh, very important if you need to do um, 
you you might need to do um, some statistics to to determine what the sample size should be. Uh, make sure the correct sampling techniques are adopted. Please, please, um, I make sure the variables in the study are clearly indicated how you collect your data and how you manage it. So this is when you uh, probably need to uh, use, um, you know, a software to collect the data. Perhaps you're using Qualtrics or you're using some sort of um, uh, other software or you're just, uh, you know, getting it from an experiment. So you, you need to describe this all in the methods section. Okay, uh, you can see dropouts. Um, that's because uh, I work in sensory and we may start off with, you know, 20 people and uh, over time uh, people get tired or people get sick. So you get dropout in numbers. So you may have started with 20, but you end up with maybe 15 in the end. All right, so statistical methods uh, are important. So for, for most of us who do science and uh, non-science subjects, statistical methods are, uh, it, it comprise an important section, the method section. And if you are requiring ethical approval to carry out the research, uh, please uh, include it in there. Uh, make it clear uh, that this has been uh, obtained and the uh, guidelines have been followed by the investigators. So you, you can mention that in your method section. Finally, we come to the results section, and this is the exciting one. Yeah, so uh, I remember how you wrote your methods. Make sure the results follow the same order. All right, so if you say you started on a protein, uh, a method for determining protein first. So when you're presenting the results, it should be the protein results that you show first. So just make sure they, they match. So that's what I mean by follow the same sequence used in the development of the research framework. If you have hypothesis, then uh, present the findings, uh, findings for each hypothesis in the same order. All right. If you have a regression or other model, uh, present the findings in a way parallel to the theory or the model developed that uh, that you identified yeah, earlier in the manuscript. That's the conceptual framework for, for the ones who, who do social science. Tables and figures. And uh, I must say this is my favorite. Sometimes you ask yourself, should I present it as a table or a figure? And sometimes it's really difficult because in my area, I have a lot of results. Figures sometimes make it hard to see, especially if you're presenting uh, a lot of analysis in a bar chart. Um, tables um, is good. They, they are really good. But nowadays with statistical methods, we, we have a lot of multivariate statistics that we can carry out. And uh, the figures that, um, you know, so you can have a lot of data that's summarized in a nice uh, PCA, for example, a principal component analysis. So, so that could be a figure that you could use uh, to, to summarize a lot of data because you've carried out some statistical analysis and transform the data into something that's more easily interpreted. So try um, not including a lengthy tra table. And I've had that experience. I, I was so uh, very um, passionate about my table and I didn't want to put it in a manuscript, but in the end, the reviewers got me to put it in the appendix. So try and avoid using a lengthy table. Captions of figures and tables. Uh, this is something you need to be aware of. It should be, you should have enough information there to make uh, the tables of figures explanatory meaning that you do not need to go back to the text in order to understand what the table or the figure is showing. Tables should not be overcrowded. 
Okay, that's just logical. And um, you, you can't use the same, uh, you can't use figures and tables which look different, but they are actually telling you the same information. So, and look at your scales, your axis label sizes, and the symbols that you use. Just make sure it's easy to see. And, um, you know, it, it, it helps the reviewer when they are reading the paper. Discussion. So this is uh, the, the final one uh, in the IMRED um, thing, uh, component of your paper. And this is where you're able to describe how the results relate to the original question objectives that you've outlined in the introduction section. So you can link your data and your findings to the conclusions and provide interpretation for each of the results presented. But you will find that most of you will be familiar that most uh, journals, you can have a combined results and discussion and that makes it, uh, I think, easier. Uh, in my experience, I find when you are having a separate discussion sec section, you need to think a lot more. Okay, so you show how the results are consistent uh, with other researchers and if there are any differences. So it demonstrates the importance of the research and why it deserves publication. Um, in my years of experience, uh, no, I haven't had much comments on discussion. Only recently I was asked to, you know, um, rediscuss. Uh, some of uh, the results, but it, it's very rare in my case. I've just had more um, uh, feedback about introductions. That's be probably because my students tend to over discuss. And if you see if you see students and how they write, uh, they often uh, put a lot of effort in discussion uh, more than um, you know, the other parts of the paper because uh, they've been trained uh, to, to do that well. Okay, so um, if there are limitations in the research, uh, you can you can edit in your discussion. Uh, sometimes if you don't do that, then the reviewers come back and say, please mention limitations of your research. So it is important. Uh, sometimes we think, oh, we, should we put that in discussion or should we put it in the conclusion? Uh, that depends. Sometimes in the discussion sections, you can have uh, limitations of research, especially if your discussion is separate from your results. And that's when you can provide directions for future research as well. So um, basically, um, in summary, restate the findings and accomplishments, evaluate how the results fit in with the previous findings, list potential limitations, offer interpretations, and state implications, um, and recommend further research. In the end, that's the conclusion and what you should include. And the big mistake of um, my, you know, uh, student, uh, that my students do is um, use what's in the abstract in the conclusion. And that's not what you should be doing. You know, you don't want to have redundant information. Conclusion is very important. And sometimes I get students to think, oh, just because it's the last section of your paper, it doesn't mean it's not important. Sometimes when I read a paper, I look at the conclusion as well because I want to see what sort of, you know, work uh, that uh, they, they propose. And, and, and that's interesting. So in the conclusion, you're supposed to present a global and specific conclusion in relation to the objectives of your research. So reiterate your research objective and tell your readers how you have achieved those objectives. You, that gives, um, that shows the reviewers that you have fulfilled the research questions and made a contribution to existing knowledge. And it helps demonstrate why the research is significant and important. So uh, this is, uh, so don't 
you know, downplay the importance of this sec section. Uh, it's, it's short, but uh, it's important uh, that you, you make a good conclusion so people know the, the weight, uh, you know, how, how important your paper is. So the next question is, how do you prepare manuscripts? So we know we've got IMRET and that, that is how, that's the components of a paper. Introduction, material methods, yeah, then uh, your results, um, and then your discussion. All right, for, so th those are the four components. So tell me, how do you prepare a draft manuscript? Do you start with your abstract? Maybe, uh, you know, uh, some of you may say, of course not. Yeah, of course not is the right answer. An abstract, although is the if it, it is the first things that the reviewers or editors see, but that's not the first thing that you will get your students to write or you yourself will write. So it's not going to be in that order. And uh, I'm going to share with you my experience when I'm getting a student uh, to prepare a research draft. So the first thing, make sure your research is publishable. Yeah, so uh, make sure it's new, it's interesting, it's, um, you know, it's challenging. Is there anything challenging? Um, uh, is it related to a current hot topic? Yeah, in food science, it's plant proteins. Hot topic is really good. Um, a lot of uh, interest in sustainability. And what you need to do is to identify has the findings of your research provided solutions to existing problems. First of all, before you start uh, writing your drive, um, this, uh, you need to decide on the manuscript type. Uh, most of us are familiar of the full articles or original articles. That's where um, uh, most of the emphasis in terms of types of manuscript is yeah uh, a lot of weightage on full articles so that these are your substantial completed pieces of research that are that are of significance as original research sometimes you have, may have carried out a short experiment but it's significant and original so you may uh, not have uh, that much results and so you may have it as a short communication so that's another manuscript type so far in I, i've only done uh, one okay or, or two uh, most of my um, manuscripts uh, that I prepare is for full, full articles. Uh, some of you may opt to write review papers, and uh, that is usually on a recent de development on a specific hot topic, and uh, it, it tends to be longer than a full article. But I think um, when it comes to uh, research, uh, people tend to lean towards full articles. Yes, you can get uh, review papers, you can get cited a lot, but um, try and have a balance. Don't go on and do uh, too many review papers because, yes, you, you can get higher impact factors for review paper journals, but the full articles are, are also just as important if not more important. So if you follow the author guidelines and uh, you, you have, you should have a manuscript, um, what, 12, 12 times new Roman font and then uh, double spacing, it should be between 25 to 40 pages. Uh, you, you must make sure the title is short and informative. Uh, this is just a guideline. Uh, your abstract, you know, is about is one paragraph. It should be less than 250 words. Introduction, one and a half to two pages long. Methods, two to three pages long. Results, six to eight pages. Um, this is just general. Yeah, so when you look at it, you can see, um, you know, when, when you're writing the paper, you're not writing too much um, or too little. So there's discussion, four to six pages long. Conclusion is just one paragraph. 
uh, figures six to eight, uh, tables one to three, and references. Yeah, yeah, you want between 20 and 50. I think food chemistry is 40. So uh, always, always read the author guidelines before you start writing. Uh, choose the journal. All right, I got another talk on how to publish in journals with high impact factor. That's something else. Okay, so I'll, I'll go through some some journals and how you uh, select them. But uh, it's very important to identify a journal before you start writing. If you have identified two or three journals, make sure you just submit to one. Yeah, wait for the responses of the editor and the reviewers. And then only if you get a rejection, go to the next one. Uh, do not uh, submit uh, the same manuscript to three different journals. I know it may be faster, but uh, not, not a good idea. All right, so the most common way of selecting the right journal is to look at the article you have read to prepare your manuscript. So if you look, uh, if you're reading, a lot of your background reading uh, is from this uh, particular journal A, you may find that maybe journal A is good for you. Very, it's very important to read the journal requirements in the guide of for authors. So um, uh, please have a look at that when you're uh, preparing your draft. Uh, you need to understand publication ethics to avoid violations like plagiarism. So be careful if you go into some high impact factor journals, they also do uh, something similar to turn it in and um, to identify plagiarism. I've had uh, an experience where my students' uh, research uh, went online, okay, uh, and I did not embargo it. And so when it when the when the reviews came back, they say, "Oh, it's no, it's plagiarism uh, because there's already a thesis. So you you've got to be very very careful when you have thesis made available to 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 public and you have not published it. But I was lucky, so I told the I told the journal editor that, uh, hey, this is um, you know based on the student's thesis. Uh, I didn't realize I had to embargo the work, and um, that's why it ended up, you know, uh, being identified as being plagiarized. So be very, very careful uh, when you have theses available online. So if you're having ethics, yeah, make sure ethics is done, especially when you're dealing with human subjects and animals, and using other authors' ideas or wordings without proper attribution. Organizing your manuscript. When you are preparing a manuscript, uh, most often you think, oh, where do I start? Abstract? Definitely no. Introduction? Yes, you will have some sort of literature review to, to help back up some of your results. So you can, you can keep it there. But what I like to do with my students is to look at their results. Uh, I get them to prepare the figures and the tables because then I can see and I want them to identify the objectives. Yeah, so have the have them present their objectives to you and uh, ask them to show you your, their figures and tables so you can decide, OK, you know, I, I want this figure, I want this table and what what you're there you're doing is you're you're trying to show um, that your results that you get, that you present your figures and tables are helping address the objective that you had in the first place. Look at the figure and tables in terms of legends, making sure they are uh, understandable. Uh, you don't need to go back to the text to look at it. Uh, you, you look at the axis, uh, the symbols are clear, you know, because they, they often come back and say, oh, this is um, the quality of your figure and tables are not good. Yeah, but uh, so you, you've got to make sure that it's um, really clear. And don't include long, boring tables. 
uh, you can include them as supplementary materials instead. So this is a good way and uh, students feel motivated because they, they're very comfortable with the results that they obtain and uh, they've analyzed it. So, you know, it, it, it's not too long. You, you can quickly hear from them when you say, okay, I want to see the figures and tables and they will come back to you. Okay, tables, what next? Write up the method section. So what you're trying to do when you're working with your students is that you want to make it more comfortable. You know, you want them to be comfortable, comfortable writing a first draft. So these are the, uh, you know, sections that they are more familiar with. Write up the method section. My students love doing that. Yeah, because uh, uh, they know what they did and they, they are able to explain it. So just make sure the methods are in the same order that they will appear in the results section. Write up the results, uh, make sure what have you found should only be uh, representative results from your research. Then you can have supporting materials. And I've noticed that if you want to publish in a high impact factor journal, uh, you, you had, you're supposed to do a lot of experiments, but you are not able to add all those results because they are, they are somewhat limited in, in terms of how many tables of figures are allowed in, um, in the journals. So what can you do? You, you have that option to move some of your results in your supporting materials section. Indicate the statistical test use. This is very, very important uh, for most of us. Uh, when we're doing quantitative analysis, that would be analysis of, it, of variance, yeah? And uh, uh, now increasingly, uh, people want to look at relationships, so they carry, carry out multivariate analysis and uh, regressions. Write the discussion. Okay, so you got um, the, the results. Uh, this is where students don't quite like it, okay? A discussion is not easy for, for some of them. Uh, some students have difficulty, I, I find, when they are looking at uh, references that will support their findings. Simple things like using the wrong keywords and then you're just coming up with wrong papers and that's where they need guidance from you. Uh, before you tell them to go off, and uh, do their discussion, just make sure what they are reading is right and relevant to the research. Because if not, they just go uh, off tangent. This is a very important section of your article. It helps sell your, your data. And a huge number of manuscripts are rejected because the discussion is weak. So you cannot downplay this. Uh, don't just look for references that uh, will support your results. If you have results that are contradictory, then uh, you, you must confront it. You must convince the reader that you are correct or better, or you've come up with a mechanism that is novel, and that's what is going to sell your paper. Write a clear conclusion. Common error in this section is repeating the abstract, like I said and listing experimental results, that's not a conclusion. Please provide your objective, you know, that uh, what I do is usually get the student to, to bring back that objective in the conclusion and uh, get them to answer, you know, how they've addressed the objective in terms of their results that, in terms of the results they obtained. So you don't want to include you know, uh, milligrams per meals and, you know, that sort of uh, results, you know, something, something that is more general. So uh, you also can suggest, you can also suggest future experiments and point out those that are underway. You can pr propose a, 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 a global and specific conclusion uh, that you, in relation to the objectives that you've uh, clarified in the introduction. So this is the characteristics of an effective research paper conclusion. Um, 
it stresses the importance of the thesis statement, gives the research a paper uh, sense of completeness and uh, leaves a good final impression on the reader. That is the last. All right. Introduction. So you've seen that I've not really gone through uh, IMRED. So when, when you write a, a draft, you don't go and write an introduction first. Get students to come up with a draft by um, getting them to you know, write something that they're more familiar with and they feel more confident. And once you see them um, in terms of confidence, um, you know, they're getting better, then I say, OK, let's get back to introduction. And you will see that most of the students will have already written their literature review and it's not going to fit into a one and a half or two page introduction. So this is where the skills of being able to summarize um, those um, readings uh, becomes important. So what is the problem to be solved that should be um, in the first uh, paragraph? So all your paragraphs are important. Make sure they are addressing something. So I, I always say when you write a paragraph, you must have a topic sentence to introduce uh, what that paragraph is about. Because it, otherwise, what you end up is you're writing a lot and there's just no structure and a reviewer will find it really difficult. And that's when uh, they get really agitated and they you know, uh, can reject a paper. So an introduction should be um, important, is very important. Make sure your paragraphs, paragraphs are so important in an introduction because you only have what, maybe four or five paragraphs. Just make sure it's clear what you're going to carry, uh, your, what you're going to write about in each paragraph. So, uh, are there existing solutions? Which is the best? What is its main limitation? What do you hope to achieve? It has to be convincing to sell your research. Introduction tips. Never use more words than necessary. Be concise and to the point. And because you only have one and a half to two pages, you need to be careful um, in terms of words. And uh, introduction must be organized from the global to the particular point of view that guides your readers to your objectives. So that's why your paragraphs are so important. At the end, you will have your, the, the last paragraph, you would have um, identified the gap from the you know, papers that you've read, that you've introduced in your introduction. And that's where you get to state the purpose of your paper. And if you want to include your hypothesis, this is a good place. And your uh, just make sure your objectives are clearly uh, reiterated. And you see, although the abstract is the first thing that you see in a paper after the title, you don't really write the abstract until you have written the other sections. All right. So now when they come to write the abstract, the, the student or you yourself will have a better understanding of what the paper is about to be able to write the abstract. So what is important? What's the importance of the research? Okay, that would be the first line. Why would a reader be interested in the larger work? So you have an opening sentence and this will state the importance of your research. So it, it can be a general statement. And the second sentence would uh, indicate what's the problem. All right, so it could be, uh, for example, functional proteins are increasingly important because meat proteins are not going to be sustainable in the long run. Okay, so what's the problem? Um, getting people to move away from, from meat, you have to make the plant proteins, uh, you know, taste better, uh, have, uh, make it more attractive to consumers. So that, that's, the, that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, and another thing about plant proteins, you don't get um, protein profile as good as meat. So that's a problem too. 
So that's that's the sort of problems that you can put in an abstract, but maybe one, two lines. And what is the scope of the project? What is the main argument or claim? And then uh, an indication of the methods that you're using. Okay, it doesn't have to be specific uh, methods like, uh, you know, uh, Smoggy Nelson. You, you just say you're using a GC method to look at the volatile composition, the physical chemical characteristics. So that's that's basically a, a general thing that you uh, uh, indicate in your methodology in terms of your abstract and some results. Okay, sometimes students get uh, so excited and then they say, oh, I've already written 250 words. I don't know where to put the results. And uh, that's that's where the skills come in. You, you don't have many lines, but you should have a bit more in the results section because that is the meat of your paper. All right. And then you end it off with uh, implications. How does this work add to the body of knowledge in terms of the topic? And if there are any practical or theoretical applications from your findings. Yeah, so we're all going backwards now. You can see that, you know, the order in which you, you prepare a draft is so different from how the paper is written. So um, in the end, you, you may have a title. Everyone has a title and just look at the title because by now you've gained a lot more understanding and try and compose a concise and descriptive title. Your title is what sells the paper. It's your first and probably the only opportunity to attract the reader's attention. All right, so for example here, there's an original title, Action of Antibiotics on Bacteria. That's too general, okay? You have to be a bit more specific. So inhibition of growth of mycobacterium tuberculosis by streptomycin will be a, a better title. All right, so uh, your title will also be important because when people do a search on Scopus, uh, that's why, how they would get your paper. So you, you have to give be a bit more descriptive. The problems most people have is writing a short descriptive title. And so my student will have a very long one and when they see that I've chopped it up, and made it very short, sometimes they feel very disheartened, but you just need to explain to them why it's important. Keywords, that's the last thing you do. Uh, don't, don't think it's, uh, oh, you know, uh, I've written the paper. You have to select the right keywords so that people are able to, to find your paper so you get your citations. So don't, don't uh, place, um, you know, little emphasis on this just because it's a keyword. Write your acknowledgements. Yeah, uh, if you've got funding, that's very important. Um, write up the references. Yes, yeah, so when you will see that your students are reading a lot, uh, you 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 must make sure first of all before they embark on postgraduate studies, make sure they are up to date with the use of softwares to like uh, EndNote. Uh, or Reference Manager by Thomson Reuters. Uh, there's also Mendeley by Elsevier, because this will just help you, uh, you know, uh, get a good record of references and uh, you're able to change from APA to, to other formats easily. So make sure, sometimes we think that the students are doing it, but uh, just check before they write a manuscript that they, they've attended training and they are using a reference software. Hey, sorry, I think we lost Prof for a while. Please speak for a while because uh, we will try to solve out this technical issue.
Hi everyone, Prophet Julie lost her internet, so please hold on and stay with us. We'll try to solve this issue as soon as possible. Thank you. Sorry, I got lost. So my, uh, I've just got Wi-Fi. So that's that's the, that that what that was a problem. I'll try and share my screen again. I probably lost you at references. Is that right? Um, Ike? Yes, that's that's just the one that I that that's actually the last slide. So um, we we I'll just bring that up again. Okay, sorry about that. Suddenly my internet was just not there. So um, references, uh, writing up the references, um, just make sure uh, that your student is trained uh, to use a software like EndNote and Reference Manager. You, you need uh, a, a software when, when you're dealing, uh, when, when it comes to writing a paper. There's also Mendeley by El Elsevier. Uh, just make sure the number of references uh, is within the prescribed limit of the journal. So again, read the guide for authors. I cannot uh, keep repeating and say uh, in terms of um, how important this is. Uh, make, make your reference list, uh, make sure the in-text citations are right. And that's it really um, in terms of references. So it, in the end, that's what you achieve. So you've got your first draft now. And I've got some tips I'd like to share with you. Um, so I have finished my PowerPoint presentation. So what I need to do now is to Can you see my screen? Probably still on your PowerPoint. Yeah, my yeah, PowerPoint. Okay. Um, yeah, I can't find that screen where I can show um, the phrase bank. Can you see a phrase bank now? No? Uh, no, still at the. No. Okay, sorry. I need to go to sharing, share again. Okay, yeah, I've got that. Oh, a lot of my things have gone. Uh, it's not there now because I've logged out. It's okay. Take your time. Uh, wait, I will just try and open it. How come I can't see? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's try this. Okay, yeah. Got it. Okay. Uh, uh, you can see a PDF diagram here, and uh, uh, this is by the University of Manchester. So if you Google Phrase Bank 
and University of Manchester, they they provide this uh, phrase, there's a bank of phrases you can use when you're writing a paper. And it's really, really useful because most of my students in New Zealand, they have English as their second language. English is also my second language anyway, but you know, so uh, you can see that uh, you can get access to this PDF file. You have to pay some money, but it's worth it. What I have is a 2018 version, and uh, this was usually provided for free uh, in uh, in the website before, but now in the UK, they've started uh, charging for it, but it's a very small sum, maybe about five pounds. So it, it's not much, but it's a navigable uh, PDF version. What I have is outdated, but I'll just show you what it is. We have students and uh, they are somewhat limited in terms of phrases that they they can use when they are writing papers. And you can see this is the University of Manchester. This is a 2018 version. And uh, I must say, John Morley did, did a great job. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, international students in the UK as well. And he's the, he's the person who established this. So you can see there are major sections. Uh, they are introduce that's introducing the work reviewing the literature describing methods reporting results discussing findings writing conclusions so it's great you can see a lot of what you need when you want to write a paper there in a phrase bank then there's a lot of general functions that they include as well writing about the fast past writing abstracts so what you can do is uh, for example i'll just go to i'll just do a control f and do abstract that's why it's um, useful and then uh, you can see you can go next and, and and look at this it tells you what an abstract is so uh you you can find a description of an abstract. I'm not going to go through this because I've already gone through it enough. But what is important is it tells you, you know, what you should put in each line and what what are the phrases that you can use. So if you're highlighting the importance of the topic, for example, that's great. You have so many phrases you can choose from. You just have to guide the students uh, in terms of what phrases to use. So I found this a, a, a great, um, uh, really uh, valuable information that students can use. And most of my students appreciate it. So if you're referencing to current literature, what would the, what would the phrase that we normally use? Many studies have reported. Yeah, but there are other ways of referencing to current literature and these are the other phrases that that um, it gives you a trigger. OK, it triggers you. Uh, oh, what should I write? How should I write it? Identifying a knowledge gap, aim of the current study. OK, so you see that the first one is the aim of the study was to that's what we all use. But you can also use a phrase like the principal objective of this project was to investigate what, what, what. All right. And, and it's, it's really useful. And, uh, you know, if you have to pay five, five pounds for it, it's not a big, it's not big money because once you've got that uh, navigable P PDF, you are able to share it with others. Can you see how, how important this is? Uh, I can go here, describing methods. It tells you, uh, and, and most of the time, in my experience, uh, is that when you describe methods, you, you say, oh, how am I going to rewrite this so that it does not, is, you know, it does not end up being plagiarized? Because many people's, people have used this method and they're describing it and you think, oh, how can I describe it in a different way? So uh, these are phrases that can help you do that. 
all right so that uh, you have uh, some some um, way of describing the method that's different from others and look at the number of phrases that uh, this person has compiled uh, it's extremely um, useful reporting results they tell you what is reporting uh, what reporting results is all about and then you can refer back to the research aims of procedure so uh, it tells you and um, the problem with this document is that it has too many phrases and you're just spoiled for choice in terms of uh, choosing the right one and that's where the students need guidance from you because they might use the wrong phrase so I, I, that's what i often get you know they say, oh yeah nazima i'm using the phrase bang but you know i say oh but this does not make sense so uh, just make sure they choose the right phrase okay they the students like to to get phrases that sounds very sophisticated but make sure they understand it before uh, choosing it in the first place writing conclusions look at this it tells you what conclusions are and then it tells you what you should include in the conclusion so you can see the first sentence is your objective this study uh, set out to or uh, in this investigation the aim was to assess so always start with your objective and if you have a second aim and then you know the different phrases and you can see my favorite one is here this study is set out to determine whether but you can also use phrases like this study is set out to better understand the what you know the study was set out to evaluate how effective you see how different it can be and this just gives you um, it triggers an idea because sometimes when we write we are not writers we're not authors of you know, um, literature, we, we are scientists, and sometimes we need this sort of phrases to trigger uh, our writing. Or we have a writer's block and we just use the same phrases. All right, so it's a really, really important um, document, and I use it a lot in my teaching. So I teach postgraduate papers at AUT. I also teach them how to to write reviews, uh, write papers. And so uh, this is how I found it. And um, I, I would like to share it with all of you. So please look up Freeze Bank. Um, yeah, sharing two applications. Um, I can look at uh, I've got just another one I just wanted to show you oh okay it's the same one so this is a review article can you see the review article yeah so um, I did not talk about review articles because this is not when when you ask me to give the talk it's more about writing a research paper so if you are happy to uh, write a review article, this is an example of, uh, you can see it's a hot topic in food science, pulse protein ingredients. And uh, you can see it's not IMRED, um, introduction, um, materials, methods, results, discussion. So uh, it's not that, in, in a review, it's quite a different format. You just have your introduction, then you have the body of your um, of uh, the topic uh, that you are going to review. So it, it looks a bit like a textbook, but no, uh, a textbook uh, is it, quite different. You, you have to have, you see, uh, lots and lots of references. And uh, when you write a review, that's when uh, paragraphing uh, becomes important. Remember, I talked about uh, introduction um, and having good paragraphs you have a lot of paragraphs to to think about and the sections you want to think about when you're writing a review so it's a different kettle of fish yeah when it when it comes to writing a review paper 
They also have systematic review papers. Uh, this is getting quite uh, popular now. Uh, it's different. That, the one that I showed you just now is more a traditional type of review paper, which you're all very familiar with. You can see I'm just taking uh, reviews from Trends in Food Science and Technology because I think that's the number one or number two. It must be the top five uh, food science journal in, in, in the world. So uh, you can see with, with a systematic re review, uh, the, the abstract is, uh, or, or any review, you can see the abstract is more structured. You see, they got background, they got approach, key, key findings. So it's very different from a normal research paper. Just wanted to show you, because some of you may be writing uh, textbook chapters, but then I, I encourage you to, to, to write and review uh, a review paper instead because uh, you, you will get more citations. So with a systematic review, it's a bit different because you, you need to uh, compile the results and uh, you need to come up with um, uh, the design. Yeah, uh, it, it's quite different. Uh, it, it's more an interesting read because they have, um, for example, inclusion and exclusion criteria for article uh, selection. So it shows you, it's so systematic in the sense that it tells you what you're doing, how you're getting those articles, which you don't get in a normal review paper. So a systematic review and how you identify um, your different database. Yeah, and uh, they, they use a, a, a software called Prisma. So, so that's interesting. I've not written a systematic review myself, so I am not able to help you in this uh, area. But yes, you do use a, a software, Prisma, that creates a flowchart. And that gives you uh, a bit more structure in terms of, because you, you, you've uh, identified it in a more systematic way. So your... Uh, when it comes to description of your, you know, uh, different sections, your titles for your different sections, it'll be more uh, systematic, I would say. Yeah. You can see uh, things like this. Obviously, this is something that I go with through with students in 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 uh, in my classes. Uh, but uh, you know, you can you can uh, do a pie chart. Uh, it, it's so it's not just about you know, describing and um, critiquing, but, uh, you know, putting that research in, in, uh, in a more focused way, systematically. Nice, I, I would like, uh, it, it, it's, it's good one, it's a good one. So that's just um, a review because that's not what I, I came to, to talk about. But yeah, uh, a review, writing a review is, can, be, can be a different talk altogether. All right, I think uh, that's uh, me for now. I'm glad I did not get cut off. I welcome some questions from from everyone. Okay, thank you very much for, for your insightful and very informative sharing section. Okay. okay, now we will move on to the Q and A section. We have any participant would like to unmute and ask the question directly before we read the question from the chat box. Shall I stop sharing, uh, Dr. E.K.? Uh, yeah, it's okay, yeah. Yes, anyone? Hmm. If no, then I will start to read out the question from the chat box, okay? Hmm. Okay, the first question from Isa. Prof, I'm from Science and Technology. I have one question. How do we know that our objective meet the criteria of for publication in web of science or high impact journals? Okay. Sometimes we think our gap novelty meets their criteria. But when it comes to reverse comment, they don't accept the paper because the paper is not novel. How to address this problem? Do we need to change the objective to a new objective to submit in a high impact journal? or submit the same paper to other high impact journals. So 
Uh, oh, that's such a good question. I, I often wonder that myself. Um, whenever you um, look at a journal, there's the scope, journal scope. Uh, we, we often go by impact factor. We are very driven by impact factor, but the journal scope often changes as well. So maybe if you were to publish in this journal, maybe two years ago, what you are doing fits into the scope of the journal. But be careful because the scope of the journal can change. So I, I, I'll tell you my experience. I used to, uh, I do a lot of sensory uh, science research. I do the food chemistry once as well. But uh, the scope for sensory science has, has changed a lot. So before it was okay to do quantitative descriptive analysis and get away with a publication in food quality and preference. Now, the scope of the journal has changed. There are more consumer centric research that they, they are looking for. And you see a lot of uh, research that's related to psychology instead uh, that is of interest in food quality and preference. Gone are the days where QDA uh, guaranteed you a publication. It's not new, but if you've got new methods of descriptive analysis, novel methods of analyzing or examining the relationship between, um, you know, the, the, the consumer perception and probably descriptive um, uh, objective methods of uh, measures of sensory attributes, then that's be becoming important. Yeah. So uh, the focus has changed. So um, you just just make sure you look at the focus. Focus are of journals change, change with times. It's like hot topics as well. What was hot topic uh, maybe uh, two years ago? Yeah, uh, in, uh, in in food chemistry was uh, maybe a plasma um, plasma curing of meat. Uh, now 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 it's not because there's so many papers on plasma cured meat. So that I think that's what you were saying. Uh, novel. So can can we change the objective? We've already carried out the research. It's there's so much we can do uh, changing the objective. There's not much room unless you want to do more work and um, have an objective that is more novel uh, to the journal. So, so that's so, so different. You, you can, that's why whenever you have a publication, my advice to you is once you've done the work, that piece of work, get the student to write and submit it then. Don't wait for two years until the student graduates because science moves at such a fast rate. What is new a year ago or six months ago is not new now. It's ever changing. And because the impact factor of uh, science journals are increasing, so are the you know, expectations of what you need to do. So um, it may have started off as it's a great project, it's novel. But yeah, um, you could change the objective. I, I need to look at the objective first, so uh, in order, but there's, there's not much. Uh, but I would say if you don't get into the journal that you want, go to the next journal. Don't, don't try and say, I just want to be in this journal. There are so many journals out there that uh, may have a scope that suits yours. So what I would do is like go shopping, yeah, shop for your journals as well. You'll be surprised when you publish, you only had maybe maybe 10 journals that you're familiar with. Look at what they have now. It's just so many, yeah, uh, you can choose from. Thank you. So I think the tip here is do not give up, right? <laughs> do not give up. Yes. Okay. It, next. Build, it builds your resilience. Okay. Thank you. Prof. Next, we have a question from YouTube. But for your information, we actually have about 
250 participants for oh. our webinar wow. today. Great. We have yeah. about 165 in WebEx and about 66 viewers in YouTube. Mm -hmm. Also, we have friends listening from Thailand and Indonesia. Thank you for uh, joining this session with us. Okay. So the next question is from Madula Lim. Good morning, Prof. May I know how can I write the implication section better? Or how do I start writing this part? Thank you very much. Yeah, I know. The introduction is the most difficult one because you have so few words um, and you want to uh, help justify and you have done so much reading, you, you, you can't fit it in two pages. So my tip, I said just now, identify what you want to have in each paragraph. So I get, I sit down with my student and we decide or on, uh, typically they have four, four to five paragraphs. We know what is in the last paragraph, right? So that's easy, but we must make sure what you want in the first, second, third, and fourth paragraph. So sit down and identify a topic sentence. Maybe you're not familiar. Are you all familiar with topic sentence? A topic sentence. So writing paragraphs is, uh, is, is actually a very important skill. And this is something I teach at postgraduate level, because uh, if you do not write the paragraph properly, it's just going to be a muddle of different studies and it'll be confusing to the reviewer. So think about what is your objective. Yeah, you've got your objective. That's great. Your introduction. Okay. What is the problem? Okay. What is out there? I gave an example like, uh, like, you know, plant protein. So what's the problem with plant protein? Uh, it's not so, you know, uh, high in pro, uh, it doesn't have all the good proteins. So what do you do about it? So that's more a general statement to put your research in perspective. That's your first paragraph. So what's your second paragraph? It will be related to uh, what you're doing, okay? What are you doing to increase the protein in plant proteins? Okay, so th that could be, um, you know, studies that carry out uh, research and you know you, you you have that topic sentence to say what people are doing to increase plant protein so that's your second paragraph and then so on and then it goes on identify the topic sentence of each paragraph then writing will be easier all right it's a lot of skill yeah you need to develop but you know it develops with time and the best way to learn is sometimes to read what people have done it's not necessarily that people have done it the correct way and you learn from that too so you learn from good um, and badly written introductions there are so many out there how about the implication the question is about implication uh, yeah implications okay so what's the implication of uh, coming up with a novel plant protein yeah, it's going to be um, in the long run uh, sustainable, right? So um, because people are moving away, I mean, you know, we, we have this uh, problem with climate change. It's not going to be sustainable in the long run to have animal proteins. So a lot of people, uh, you know, plant proteins will play an important role. So, so, you know, that sort of implications That's what I mean by implications. Look at your work and how it fits with what's happening in the world. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. The second question from Isa. So another question is, sometimes while reading journals, I find that they have a paper with such a simple data analysis method that can still be accepted in a high impact journal. What's your opinion on this? Oh yeah, I, I can, that resonates with me and I just see why, what my, my, um, you know, you, you think it's simple, but maybe again, first of all, look at when the paper was published. Okay. So I, she's not here or, or the person who asked me this question is not here. That would be my first question to you. When was it published? If you say a year ago, it's, it's too long science moves so fast what you get accepted a year ago was work done three years ago or two years ago 
you know, it takes about a year to get things published. So you may say, hey, you know, this is a this uh, is just a year old article, but it's not one year, it's at least two years. So um, that's one way. That's how I would go about it. And then you say simple. Uh, you know, um, if you, you you publish in Nature, everything should be simple. Yeah, yeah. So it's very high impact factor. You but you must write it in a way that people understand it. So although they may have carried out very complex analysis, it may look simple in Nature. But that's because they want the 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 majority to 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 understand. Uh, what is being written, yeah. So uh, it's a bit hard um, because I I don't know what analysis and you know it, it's nice. That's why the best when you have a when you have a presentation like this is to follow it up with um, a writing workshop, yeah. Then you you can get this uh, questions answered better because I can physically see what that paper is and give you a a right response but yeah you can always email me and we can share thank you very much prof okay we move to the next question from sophia i have a question does each paper have to verify the results and reliability validity is it okay to use an interview Sorry, is it okay to use an interview interview yeah hmm. Are you asking, okay, that it's okay to, to have interviews, okay? Maybe uh, you're, you're in the social science. So you, you have interviews instead of something more quantitative. Uh, but there are ways of uh, analyzing qualitative results. So uh, you may need to look at that options. I, I cannot say that if you do interviews, you cannot publish. There, there are a lot of work in social science that are being published in that manner. But for me, I'm just, it's been science. So I've not done much qualitative um, research to be able uh, to help you with that. But I can tell you uh, for sure that there are studies that, that use this um, qualitative methods of interviewing. It's it really depends on the number of participants. So, you know, when you're talking about reliability and all that, uh, you need to do maybe something like a power calculation using statistics so that you know the number of people you've interviewed um, will be sufficient. Uh, so that's usually what they look for in instead of reliability or validity. So you have the validity, validity of the results depends on, on your participants. So you, you must have some way of convincing the reviewer that you you um, you you've done enough uh, and the, you've you've had enough participants in this case for that you've done interviews with uh, to um, arrive at uh, some conclusions that you can make. Out. So if you have one, two people, maybe uh, not not a good idea. Mm. Okay, I think that's what the person means by interview. Okay, thank you very much. So next question from Diana: How to differentiate between background and introduction? <laughs> okay, good. Background is probably okay we don't have background so much in in uh, in a paper it's actually probably the the first um the first uh, it will be included the background will be provided in the first paragraph of your introduction i wouldn't say it's different because in a paper you don't you don't provide background you maybe people use background and introduction interchangeably but um yeah we, we don't call it background introduction is um, background is usually in uh, proposals so if you're writing a proposal they require a background before you jump into a literature review so because they don't they don't have an introduction I, I I'm not sure but I've seen backgrounds more in proposals rather in papers the question from departing so can you please comment on consumer based researchers in medical science towards the outcome of medicine production in the pharmaceutical, biomedical engineering, 
Meaning, do the real discovery be produced or being altered or enhanced by the pharmaceutical giants? Are the final production safe to be consumed? Well, yeah, I know. Yeah, we, we have the same thing in, in food as well. Um, yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, you, you, you know, your research is good and it will be valuable uh, to mankind. But yes, you can get, um, you know, it might not be good for business. Yeah, so, uh, for example, there's a lot of work on sugar and how, uh, you know, some people say it's not good for health, but those, there are not many papers uh, that are published on that, although we know now sugar is not good for us. But that's because uh, the sugar industry is huge player. They make lots of money. Just imagine Coke. Coke is even cheaper than water in some countries. So you can imagine how much money they are making. Well, you can't go and write a paper, you know, uh, about the ill effects of coke. It's not going to get published. It's going to be really hard. So that's why you can't name things. And uh, yeah, I think some people say it's it it can happen. But um, personally, I've I've not um, I've not gone into that that area, you know. Um, that's not, I know it's really good, but you know, it, you, you don't get a very good success rate in terms of getting a journal article because it can be biased and it can affect the company. I think when it comes to publishing, they don't want to have that, um, you know, bias uh, towards consumers. Uh, please remember that consumers don't read journal articles. Yeah. They read a lot of uh, articles that you see in the newspaper. So although you may be good, yeah, and sometimes the the newspaper can pick up research like this, but it's it's, it's pretty slim. Yeah, but you, yeah, I I, I understand what um, where that's coming from. I don't know whether it's right, but it's really hard when it, when you have questions online and I'm not talking to the person. So, um, yeah, if you want to talk to me, just email me and, not, and we can have a discussion. So perhaps the last question is negative result publishable. Ah, oh, that's a good one. Oh, my, you know, um, I'll share you an experience. I did my PhD at Strathclyde. And I had a, I have a friend, she was Malaysian and she finished a PhD in uh, her, her PhD experiments in a, in a year and a half. And you say, wow, but she had a negative result. You probably need about one and a half years to publish that. That's because you have to be convincing as to why your results are negative and why it contradicts other studies. And so you may have to look into the mechanism. You have to be a lot more convincing. But I would say, no, you can publish negative results, but um, it depends. Maybe it's something novel. I think hers was about cot death. You know, babies uh, dying when they're sleeping in the cots. And, and she found something quite different from what others have found. Uh, but uh, she was able to, to publish it because her, her work was novel, never been done before. People don't know much about caught, the caught death syndrome. So this it was something novel. So although it was negative, it was still published. But it takes you longer. Thank you very much, Prof. I think Professor Najima is not only a prolific writer, but also a speaker of sentence. Okay, help us along and keep us motivated and stay focused from 10 p.m. until now. Okay, thank you, Prof. Well, okay, for thank now, you all. we have already known how to draft the research paper. The next big question will be when? As the thing goes, the best time to start was yesterday. The next best time is now. So start now, correct? But before that, please spend one minute to fill up the attendance and the feedback form that will be given in the chat box by the secretary. And now, may I speak for your kind cooperation to actually 
turn on your camera so that we can have a group photo together. Yes, please. Ah, you we'll wait for like one minute for everyone to turn on the camera. Oh, it's so lovely to see all of you. Everyone is smiling profusely oh. from a very informative sharing session. Everyone ready? Is everyone ready? Yes, perhaps uh, you can start to take the picture. Okay, ready? One, two, three. One more. One more, one, two, three. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, Pro, for your time sharing section today. Right. So, for thank our participants, you. please do be reminded to fill up your attendance and the feedback form that will be given in the chat box soon. Okay. Um. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. Prof. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Prof. My pleasure. Come see me <laughs> when you have time. Thank you, Prof. Pfizer. Thank you, Prof. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Prof. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Prof. I got the thank uh, you, Prof. It, it is five quid. Uh, the twenty twenty one version. Oh, good on you. Yeah, good on you. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to crack your brains now. I about know. Braces to use. Definitely going to be. Oh, mashallah, it's going to be very, very helpful. And I'm also teaching uh, a quantitative research method. So I'm definitely going to gonna share this with my students like immediately, like tomorrow. <laughs> so oh, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you so you. much. You've been very, very kind. Thank you very much. Take care, bro. Yeah, you too. Thank you, Dr. Ike. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bye. Thank you, Prof. Najima. Thank you, Dr. Ike.